So if you could turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. We're going to start reading at verse 36 this morning and read through the end of the chapter. Uh, with our All In series, we are basically going through different scenes from Luke and Acts that help us better understand the gospel. And as we see people encounter Jesus, we see people being all in, that they meet Jesus and then follow Jesus. And this is certainly true of this story this morning. So Luke chapter 7, let's look at verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked him, asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she had learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now the Pharisee who had invited him saw this. He said to himself, well, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him. She is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He answered, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. So Jesus said to him, you have judged correctly. And turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are or have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. And those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this that even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Let's pray together. Father God, what a powerful story from your word. And I pray that as we work our way through this passage this morning, you will give us insight to the, on one hand, the the great debt that we owe as people who have sinned and wronged you, but also that we will understand the, the extent of your grace which you lavish upon us, especially through the work of Christ on the cross on our behalf. So, Father, would you guide us, guide our conversation? Father, I pray that you would give me the words to share and that you would help each of us to, to receive your word well this morning, that we would be changed because of it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I, I think for all of us, there are those things in life we really kind of have to force ourselves to do. I mean, we do them because we have to. We do them because it's, it's a discipline or it's the responsible thing to do. I don't know many people who just love mowing the yard, washing the dishes, changing diapers. I mean, these are things that, you know, we don't just wake up in the morning and say, I just can't wait to do this. And then there's another set of things that we do because we love to do them. It may be, you know, taking a hike or going on a bike ride for many of you. You know, it's not hard to do these things. It's not hard to put on the orange clothes on Saturdays and watch the Tennessee game, right? We all do that, don't we? <laughs> Eating dessert is not hard. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of things, you know, it's not that I'm going to discipline myself to eat more dessert this year. I mean, it's just, we do it because we love to, not because we have to. And the, the, the unfortunate thing is I think sometimes we take following Jesus 
And we place it in this list of things that we have to do or things that well, we don't do it because we love it. We do it because we're being responsible and this is the right thing to do. Uh, for, for example, we, we may look at, at things such as even involvement in church. Sometimes it's hard to get out of bed on Sunday mornings and drag ourselves. And, and even when we're here, just, just worshiping. I mean, not just singing the songs off the screen, but really focusing on the God that we're worshiping. Sometimes it's like we have to force ourselves. It, it, it's not always, I mean, we want it to be something we love to do, but sometimes we put that in the category of things that we, we do because we have to. Or, you know, we, we just pass the offering bags. And sometimes even giving to support the Lord's work is something that, you know, Paul said something about being a cheerful giver, but boy, it sure feels like a discipline and something that I have to do instead of something that just, I do it because I love it and I do it cheerfully and joyfully. And, and, and we can go on through this list of things that it takes to, part of what it means to follow Jesus. And we put it in this, well, I'll do it because I'm responsible and because I'm supposed to, instead of doing it out of, I do this because I love Jesus. Now, as, as we look at this story in, in Luke's gospel, we see very clearly someone who is loving Jesus out of a passion. I mean, I, I, you don't get the feel that this act is something where she said, you know, I really feel like I have to do this. And I'm going to make myself go do this. This was an act of someone who knew Jesus and loved Jesus. And she followed Jesus, not out of duty or discipline, but out of deep gratitude and love. Now, before we get into this in detail, let me just mention that this account is not found in other Gospels. And it can be confusing because other Gospels include a story that is similar to this, but it's also quite different. You see, in the other Gospels, we'll read an account of Jesus having his feet washed in Simon's home. But notice the difference. In the other Gospels, it's Simon who is a leper, not Simon who is a Pharisee. And it's not a woman who is considered a sinful woman. It's, it's by Mary of Bethany. She's the, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And you begin to understand there are so many differences between these two stories that you begin to realize this is a different event. So Luke is writing about a, a, a historical event, an account that you don't read about in other Gospels. And it's a good time just to mention this about the Gospels, that God chose to reveal Jesus to us through four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. A Gospel is a life story that is written for the purpose of persuading people that Jesus is God, you can put your faith in him. It's not a strict biography. It's not a strict history. It's, it's a life story written to persuade and to convince. And when you have four perspectives of the same life, you may see that one author highlights certain details of one event, or maybe they group a, a few events thematically instead of chronologically. I mean, you, you, or they may include an event that, that other gospel writers didn't. But when you get the full picture, the life of Jesus from four different perspectives, then we are seeing Jesus the way God intended for him to be revealed. And in this case, we see that Luke, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, included this story that shows us what it means to not just know Jesus, but to love Jesus. And that we who have been forgiven of a great debt should be deeply grateful to the Lord. And, and, and here's the scene. Jesus is invited to Simon's house for dinner. Now, we read Simon is a Pharisee. And, and the way these meals were, were set up, we read that Jesus reclined at the table. You see, the tables were really low to the ground. People didn't sit in chairs like we do today. They would, they would lay down and kind of recline against the table with their feet 
pointing out. Now, now the other thing that's different, I mean, we don't normally eat this way today. Another cultural thing that's different was even though they were inviting people to dinner that would recline around the table, these were public events. Often, these meals would be held out in the courtyard of a home. And they would invite people from the community to come and, and gather around the courtyard so that they could hear the conversation. Even if they held the dinner inside the home, they would keep the doors open because they wanted people from the community to come in and hear the conversation that they were having around the table. That's why when we read this, this account in Scripture, there's no shock that this lady is here. I mean, there, there, there's no, no one saying, hey, who let her in the door? This is a private meal. You don't read that because it was common for people from the community to sit around the edges. Now, granted, you were there to hear but not be heard. <laughs> you were to sit quietly and listen as the people around the table had their conversation. Now, we read that Simon is a Pharisee. Pharisee is a word that we run across a lot in the Bible, especially the New Testament. A Pharisee, is a, the, the Pharisees started about 300 years before Jesus was born, in between the writings of the Old Testament and the New Testament. There are about 400 years there where God was not communicating Scripture to people. We call it 400 years of silence sometimes. Well, during that time, there are a group of men that realized God's judgment has come upon us as a nation because we have not been living by the law. So they committed themselves to reading the law, studying the law, understanding the law, obeying the law, enforcing the law. They were to be separate from other people. And that's kind of the root of the word Pharisees, is, is to be separate. And they were easy to pick out. They wore the long robes, the prayer tassels. They had, they called them phylacteries that you wore on your wrist and your forehead, little boxes with scripture in it. They were the ones who were going around always trying to do the right thing and always pointing out when you did the wrong thing. And so it's Simon, a Pharisee, a good guy, trying to do the right thing, but in the process becomes very judgmental and hypocritical and unloving towards others. It's Simon who invites Jesus over to dinner. And it's an interesting thing that not only did Jesus eat with tax collectors and sinners, he also ate with the self-righteous people as well. And what a contrast. You've got Simon, the upstanding Pharisee, and then you've got this woman. Did you notice how scripture referred to her? There was a woman of the city. She was a local. She was well-known. She was a woman of the city. People knew who she was. Everybody knew who she was. But notice what it says next. She was a woman of the city who was a sinner. I mean, can, can't you almost just see someone's lips snarling when they say that? She's a sinner. So she was well-known, but she was well-known for all the wrong reasons. Everywhere she went, she carried around this reputation that was probably well-deserved. She had sinned. Everyone knew it. She walked around with her reputation, really with this metaphorical scarlet letter of the letter S, the sinner. And can you imagine what that must have been like? to go through this community with everyone knowing your reputation. You are immediately judged. You are always considered guilty. You are proven guilty before considered innocent. No one wanted to be your friend. No one would want to associate with you unless they wanted to take advantage of you. Now, Luke doesn't tell us what her sin is. You can guess at it, but really it's not important to the story. What's important to the story is that she was a sinner and everybody knew it and that was her reputation. And she walked around as an outcast, as the lowest rung of society until one day when she encountered Jesus. Now I think important for us to understand this account is for us to understand that she met Jesus prior to this meal. She was not forgiven as a result of what she did at this meal. She did what she did at this meal because she had been forgiven. 
Now, Luke doesn't record for us when this encounter was, but it sure is fun to dream and to imagine. I mean, could she have been one of those people crammed into the house when they lowered the man who couldn't walk through the ceiling? And instead of Jesus saying, take up your bed and walk, he looked at him and said, your sins have been forgiven. Could she have been there thinking, this guy has the authority to forgive sins? Maybe she heard about the, the servant of the centurion being healed that we talked about last week. Maybe she was there. If you make your way through Luke 7, you see the next account is, is a funeral procession of a widow's son. She's already lost her husband. Now she's lost her son. Jesus just didn't let funeral processions go by. <laughs> he stopped the, the parade and said, he's not dead. Get up and walk. Did she hear about that? I mean, we know that Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners. Maybe she was at one of those times where she was having a meal with Jesus with a group of people, and in that she put her faith in Jesus. And he looked at this person who everyone else cast aside as a sinner, as, as the, the, the worst of society, and Jesus looked at her with compassion and with acceptance and offered forgiveness, and her life was transformed and her character was changed. We don't know exactly when that happened, but at some point, she put her faith in Jesus and was forgiven. So when she heard the buzz around town that Jesus, the prophet, is having dinner with Simon, the Pharisee, just three blocks down the road, she knew exactly what she needed to do. She ran into her house, and I can just picture her digging through the bedroom until there it is, the alabaster flask. Not the cheap perfume. This is the good stuff. I've put it in this special jar for special occasions. Was it expensive? We don't know, but I bet it was expensive to her. And so she grabbed it, and she knew what she needed to do. This is the man who forgave me for my sins, which are many, and I need to say thank you. So she comes into the courtyard or, or, or into the house, and she, she finds herself sitting among people in the community. And I just imagine the dinner guests walking into the room, and there's Simon. And you know how it is when you're hosting things. You're a little nervous about everything. I mean, hey, I've got Jesus coming for dinner. Things better be good, right? Don't burn the chicken. You know, it's got to be good. And so he comes in, and he's probably looking at the table settings and hoping everything's right. And he's probably glancing around the room to see what community people showed up. And he, there's no doubt in my mind, he probably looked at this woman and had that look of, Really? You're here? I think she would have felt the judgment of, of Simon and other teachers of the law, or maybe some scribes, all these people who had judged her her entire life. You are a sinner. And then can you imagine when Jesus walks in? The one who did not look with judgment, the one who did not try to cast her out, but the woman who, or the, the man who showed the woman acceptance and love and forgiveness. I honestly think she was just overcome by her emotions. As she walks over to the feet of Jesus, planning to anoint her, his feet with oil, the downpour happens. It says she was weeping. We read the phrase in there that she wet his feet with her tears. The word wet is used in other places of, of, of rain, of a downpour. When, when Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that, that God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust, this is the word that he uses. When James says that Elijah prayed that it would not rain and it did not rain for six months, this is the word that he uses. And you need to understand, these are not just tears trickling down her face. She is weeping. She is sobbing. This is not, by the way, a pretty scene. It would not surprise me if her body is, is just shaking from, from the emotion that she's experiencing. If she's wearing makeup, it's, it's all over everything, okay? Her nose is running. Tears are just streaming down her face onto the feet of Jesus. This, this is not a pretty scene. 
But then she does something that goes against every cultural standard of the day. She lets down her hair. You see, women in that culture always had their hair up. It was at least undignified, possibly even immodest to let your hair down. But she wasn't expecting on the, she wasn't expecting the old crying thing. She didn't bring a towel. So she lets down her hair and begins to dry the feet of Jesus. And then being even more moved with gratitude and with love, she begins to kiss the feet of Jesus. And she takes this flask, this alabaster flask, this this precious jewel, and she opens it up, and that which was so valuable to her, she begins to anoint the feet of Jesus. At this point, Luke changes the, the scene a little bit because you see this woman just pouring out her love. And then he switches over to Simon. And Simon's just doing mental gymnastics over this whole thing. Because he's trying to think through who Jesus is. He's trying to understand who Jesus is. Is he a prophet? Could he be the Messiah? Here's his conclusion. He can't be a prophet. If he was a prophet, he would know who this woman is, what she has done, what kind, and the implication is there's no way he would let her touch him because that was the mindset of a Pharisee. Some who have written about Pharisees say that if they just bumped into a tax collector, they would immediately turn around and go home and take a bath and wash their clothes because they had been stained by the physical contact of a tax collector. So there is no way you would let someone with this reputation touch you, much less like cry on your feet and kiss your feet. I mean, this is getting a little awkward, honestly. (laughs) And so while he's trying to figure out, is he a prophet? I love what Jesus did. He read his thoughts. (laughs) He did what, he acted as a prophet. Simon, I know what you're thinking, and I have something to say to you. You know, let's just pause here. Because you see these two responses to Jesus, don't you? You see Simon trying to figure Jesus out with his head, and you've got this woman loving Jesus from her heart. And, and I, I don't think this passage sets up this dichotomy of it's either head or heart, because when you look at this, Simon is trying to understand, but the woman already understands. She knows that Jesus is the one that has the authority to forgive sins. He's the one that has forgiven me of my sins. And so she's not trying to figure out who is Jesus. She knows who Jesus is, and she's responding passionately. You know, right thinking should lead to passionate living. Knowing Jesus should lead to loving Jesus. And this is what we see here. So, so Jesus looks at Simon and says, you don't think I'm a prophet, but, but I know what you're thinking. And let me tell you a story. And let, let's, let's read that parable again. By the way, he tells a parable. A parable is, is kind of like a proverb. We just went through a series on the Proverbs. It, it's kind of like a proverb. It's a story that has a point. And usually within a parable, there's a surprising twist now, our problem is we are, a lot of us are familiar with these parables, and so we're not really taken by the, 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 the power of, of the surprising twist in these stories. But really, where you find that twist, that's where you begin to find the point of the parable. So let's, let's read this. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. I'm in verse 42 now. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which one of them would love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. Jesus said, hey, you got, you got an answer right. Way to go. <laughs> so here's the story. It's a simple story. A money lender, a guy who makes his living by loaning out money and having people pay back, he loaned two people really a good amount of money, 50 denarii. A denarii is basically a day's wage for a common worker. So if you're working six days a week, you do the math, you're right at about two months of income. That's not a small debt, by the way. Two months income might be 
what you would owe possibly on your, on your car. But then there's this other guy that owed 500. I mean, you're getting close to two years salary at this point. This could be what you might owe on your house. So if you think of it in those terms, there's one guy with a, with a car loan and another guy with, with a mortgage on his house, and they both come to the point where I can't keep paying this. I mean, what brings you to that point is usually something tragic. I lost my job. There's an illness. I'm injured. I had to take on an unexpected cost because something bad may have happened to someone else. But anyway, I'm at this place where I've tried to figure out everything. We canceled cable. Don't know if they did that there, but... <laughs> We did a yard sale. We got rid of stuff. We downsized. We did all this. But we still cannot pay back this loan. So they did the humbling thing. The last resort is to come back to the lender and say, hey, can we renegotiate? Can we refinance this? And by the way, when you refinance, you know who usually wins at the end of the day? It's, it's the lender, right? Yeah, we'll... we'll, we'll Reduce your payment and lengthen this loan. We're going to add more interest onto this. And you end up, at the end of the day, he made a lot more money than if you would have paid it on time. So you almost expect this money lender to say, ah, I can find a solution to this. But he does something shocking. You owe me two months income. You owe me two years income. How about let's just cancel all of it? That's unexpected. To cancel a debt. Now, we use the word, and it's an appropriate word, to forgive a debt. Actually, the word that is used here for cancel has at its root the word charis, which is the Greek word for grace. So both of these individuals came with great debt, and they experienced grace. This is the point. And when you have been, when you've experienced grace, when you've been forgiven of a great debt, you should respond with deep gratitude. So he asked, which one is going to show more love? And Simon said, well, I guess it's the one who owed two years worth of salary. He said, that's it. And then he looks and says, do you see this woman? What a profound question. <laughs> Simon, do you see this woman? Or, or do you just see a sinner? Do you see someone that, that you've put into a category? Or do you see this woman? And Jesus walks back through what this woman had done. He said, Simon, look, look what she did. When I came into that, and by the way, what he's doing, he's condemning Simon while affirming the woman. He says, when I came into the house, you didn't offer any water. Now, in those days, you walked around sandals or barefoot. Your feet were just caked in dirt and dust by the time you got to someone's house. You would minimally have a basin of water to, to, to rinse off your feet. On a special occasion, you would have a servant there to wash the feet of people that came in. Jesus said, Simon, you didn't even have water for my feet, but she keeps on, and that's the verb tense, it's continual. She keeps on wetting my feet with her tears and drying them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss. That sounds really awkward, doesn't it? <laughs> it was common in that culture, and it still is in a lot of Middle Eastern cultures, for men to greet each other with a kiss on the cheek. I am not suggesting that we adopt that at Venture Church. <laughs> Except for Jamie. <laughs> At least that sounded like Jamie. <laughs> but he's saying, you didn't even give me the customary greeting. Look what she's doing. She's going way beyond just the common greeting. She keeps kissing my feet. You did not anoint me with oil. Now, this was not common. It's not like you carried your olive oil with you and 
anointed everyone that you saw. But if you had a special guest in your house, it was a sign of honor to take olive oil, which, by the way, is very inexpensive, and just put some olive oil on, on his head as a way of honoring him as a special guest. He said, you didn't even take the inexpensive olive oil and put it on my head, but she's taking something very costly to her. And she's anointing my feet. He's saying, you did not even do the bare minimum. But she's gone above and beyond. And why? Because she was forgiven of much. And it's an important thing for us to ask, how was she forgiven? And we see that at the very end of the chapter in verse 50. He said to the woman, your faith has saved you. You see, there's, there's a way you could read this story and say, well, if you just cry a lot and kiss Jesus on the feet, you can be forgiven. That's why it's important for us to understand. It was not this act that brought about her forgiveness this act was in response, was out of gratitude and love that she had been forgiven. And, she, and when you understand that, what she did became normal. Of course you would respond this way. Because first of all, she understood the depth of her sin. I mean, everywhere she went, she was told, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. And she, she understood that. She lived with that. She knew that she needed to be forgiven. And then there's Simon, who doesn't see his sin. I mean, he looks at, I pray three times a day. I pray on the street corner. I put the verses in my phylactery. I have these long prayer tassels. I live by the law. I do everything I'm supposed to do. I fast. I tithe. I do all of these things. But he was blind to his sin. And you're not going to be forgiven unless you understand the extent of your sin, the depth of your sin. Even the fact that he calls this woman a sinner. Do you know what kind of person calls someone else a sinner? <laughs> someone who doesn't realize that they are a sinner. But this woman, she understood the depth of her sin. But that's really not enough because she also understood the depth of God's grace. She knew not only that she was a great sinner, she knew that there was a great Savior. And, and I want to come back to this parable for a minute. Because we read this parable, there was someone who owed 50 denarii. Okay, that's a lot of money, but not as much as 500. So he's probably talking about the Pharisee. Well, there's someone else who owed 500 denarii. Oh, we know who that is. That's this sinful woman. But there's a third person in that parable. There's the money lender. And think about it. The money lender is the one to whom you owed the great debt, and he's the only one with the authority to forgive that great debt. And this is the difference between the woman and Simon, is that the woman realized that Jesus is the one to whom I owe this debt because of my sin, and Jesus is the one who can forgive this sin. And so suddenly it's like, of course, when I understand my hopeless situation because of my sin, and I also understand the grace of God that was lavished on me, that, that he would say those words, your faith has made you whole, you are forgiven, go in peace. When she heard these words, she, her response was just loving, passionate response. To know Jesus is to love Jesus. So, of course, she's going to, to weep, and she's going to kiss, and she's going to anoint with oil. And here she is washing these feet, which suddenly seems like a very normal response. And Simon seems like the one that's being abnormal by doing nothing. As she's doing this and washing his feet, she knew who Jesus was. But what she could not know is that these feet that she was washing, that within a couple of years, they're going to take these feet and they're going to nail them to a cross. 
and he's going to stretch out his arms. He's going to say, it is finished. And that when Jesus was on that cross, all of these sins that this woman had committed was placed on him. And all of the sins that I've committed and that you've committed were placed on Jesus on the cross. And when he cried out those words, it is finished. It's the same word that people would stamp on a loan when it was repaid. Paid in full. You no longer owe this debt. And so here's the money lender taking all of our sins on the cross. And now they're paid in full. It is finished. And those of us, when we understand how guilty we are, that though that the word says that though you stumble on only one part of the law, you're guilty of the whole thing. When we understand the hopeless situation that we are in as people who have sinned against the living God and stand deserving only his wrath, and then we understand that God took that wrath that we deserve and he poured it out on his son on the cross so that we can be forgiven, then we begin to understand the grace of God. And when we understand our sin, that, there, that we are way worse than we ever thought we were, and the grace of God that he has given us far more than we could ever deserve, doesn't it make sense that we would respond with passionate living, with loving Jesus, one of the things we see in this woman is that she was transformed. Did you notice Jesus never called her a sinner? Because he saw her as forgiven. You have been changed. You're no longer a sinner. Now the expectation is you've been forgiven, you've been transformed, so as you go, you're going to live a little bit differently. Not because you put this in this list of now you have to live differently, but it's because we love Jesus more than we love our sin because we understand the depth of our sin and the grace of God, and so we lovingly choose to obey. Isn't this what Jesus said? If you love me, keep my commandments. Take obedience out of this category of things you have to do and put it in this category of things that you love to do because you understand the great debt that has been wiped away by the grace of God. What else did the woman do? Well, she went and found something valuable that she's going to give. When we talk about being a cheerful giver, gratitude to God should lead to generosity with God. And, and, and giving to support the Lord's work should not be something that we put in this list of, oh, I have to do it, money's tight, but it's, it's going to hurt, and I'm going to give. I mean, Paul talks about a cheerful, joyful giver, and you can only do this cheerfully when you keep reminding yourself of the depth of your sin and the depth of the grace of God. Because when you come back to that point, one of the most cheerful things you can do is to give to the Lord through a local church or ministries or wherever the Lord leads you to give. But a generous lifestyle should flow out of a gratitude for what God has done by lavishing his grace on you. And then we also see this woman was passionate in her worship. I mean, this, this is what this is. This was an act of worship. You're God. You've forgiven me. And I'm going to pour out my gratitude and love really through this act of worship. And I know there are sometimes it's hard to come to church. We're busy, we're tired, and I believe me, I am well aware that there are football games on at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. I get that. But when you step back and you take a look at the depth of our sin and what we deserve and the extreme steps that God took to lavish his grace upon us, Shouldn't gathering with the Lord's people, singing songs where we can lift our hands in worship of the great God and celebrate his grace and his love, 
hearing his word taught. Shouldn't there be a side of us where this is not just something we have to do, but out of gratitude for the grace of God, this is something we love to do? Because you see, with when we've been forgiven a great debt, we should respond with deep gratitude. Right thinking should lead to passionate living. And knowing Jesus should lead us to loving Jesus. And one of the most powerful expressions of this truth is what we're about to do when we celebrate the Lord's table. One of the ways we can come and remember what God has done for us, where we fully embrace the depravity of our sin and that we deserve nothing but God's wrath, but then we're going to hold a cracker and a little cup of juice and remember that these elements remind us that even though we deserve God's wrath, his son came and his body was given for us and his blood was shed for us so that we can have a right standing with God. That's the power of the gospel. And if there's anything we can do that comes and says thank you to God, it's remembering him through the table. Now in just a minute, the worship team is going to come back up and lead us in a song. And as they do, we're going to ask you just to go to one of the tables. Take a cracker and a cup of juice. Now at the end of the song, Rob is going to come and lead us in taking the elements together. Uh, so just hang on to them. But during this time, reflect on what you've heard. I mean, embrace the depth of our sin and, and the extent of the grace of God. Now, I know some of you are visiting today, so I want to be, make sure I say that this is not Venture's table. Different churches do different things. Communion is for everyone who believes. So we invite everyone to, to participate in this. And if you have not yet come to the point of putting your faith in Jesus, instead of just taking a cracker or, or a juice, listen to the message of this. That God, who is the judge, sent his son Jesus and he looks at you not as one to be condemned, not as a hopeless sinner, but one that he loves, one that he will accept, one that he will forgive as you place your faith in him. Let me pray, and then we'll take the elements together. Father God, thank you for the truth of your word and that we could come together and learn so much from this story of a woman who was forgiven of much and loved you extravagantly. This sign that how she displayed that through washing the feet of Jesus. And Father, I pray that as we take an act of taking a piece of a cracker and a cup of juice, that our heart would be in the same place as this woman. That we would be so aware of the, of the depth of our sin, but also the extent of your grace. And may we worship you passionately as we receive of these elements together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.